out of there, folks. And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. I am Cam Hale. As always, sitting across the table from me, the skipper to the, I, I guess you really couldn't say champions, but starting off their season with a hell of a win, Skipper Kyle Filson of the Durham Bulls. Mr. <laughs> Filson, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome, man. Yeah, that's right. We just had our very first baseball game. And we, we kicked butt, man. We won like 13-3, to 3, so very good. Turns out not only am I pretty good at podcasting, but also at coaching baseball. I wouldn't say pretty good. It's all of that. But, I mean, you're decent, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, it was a good time. So we're, we're 1-0, and so that's pretty good. And then, uh, let's see, you've got a game uh, tonight. If you listen to this on Monday, the game is tonight. That's right, yeah. So. Have another one coming up, so that'll be a good one. Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm gonna have to go check it out because uh, Jacob's pitching. Yep. Yep. And that's going to be some fun. So besides all of that, besides the way all that stuff went down, what else have you done? Other than that, I've been doing some work. I've been talking uh, with a couple of listeners about some stories and stuff we might be doing in the upcoming next few shows. Uh, just, you know, basically gathering information. Uh, you know, there's so much of it comes in mm-hmm. through email and stuff that um, and try to reach out to certain people. Certain people, you know, of course we read everything. But uh, some people drop lines of thread, then, and then I can, you know, we go back and forth, and, and we explore it to be used on a future episode. Because, as if you can imagine, producing two shows every week, uh, you know, it gets tough sometimes yeah. to come up with new material. And uh, a lot of sightings, uh, when you're working on possible things for unusual encounters uh, and things like that. But just staying busy, you know, just, you know, keeping my nose to the grindstone. Living the dream? Living the dream, man. Well, uh, I've got you somebody that's not living the dream, folks, and uh, it's something, Kyle, I think you're really going to enjoy. This comes from ScienceAlert.com. The folks over in Russia are keeping us safe from the robot overlords, people. A robot was just arrested by Russian police, and they said a good thing was is it went without resistance. Resistance is futile, folks. A robot has been arrested, it says, while taking part and get a load of this, a political rally in Russia after police intervened to prevent it from interacting with the public. So mm. like, yeah. Now now I guess that's the only way that you can protest in Russia is have a robot do it so Putin can just unplug your robot and not unplug you. But it says according to reports, this activist robot called Promobot, huh? Funny that was manufactured by a Russian company of the same name, and it was detained by police as it interspersed with the crowd at a rally in support of Russian parliamentary candidate Valery Kolechev in Moscow, it says. Now, it says the bizarre situation is, in fact, that this is the same model of robot, get a load of this, that previously tried to escape the manufacturer's warehouse twice. Really? The robot's trying to escape the manufacturer's warehouse? Trying to get away. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, they said, according to eyewitnesses, this is what they said, police asked to, to remove the robot away from the crowded area and even tried to handcuff him. Said the robot put up no resistance whatsoever. So, look, it, it says, given the totally peaceful nature of Promobot's role in the rally, conducting voluntary surveys is what it was doing. That's all it was doing. It's strolling around, trying to get some surveys and stuff. And it's, a, um, you know, I guess you could say maybe it was a safe way of interacting with people if you see things like that. And it says, of course, giving Promobot's continued clashes with the law and the inevitable media attention they seem to generate there's also another possibility. People are leaning more towards the fact that this is an elaborate publicity hoax completely staged by Promobot, the company, not the robot. So they're thinking that this is, you know, one of those things that's maybe going to get it, you know, the ball rolling to go, hey, look, you know, our robots out there, you know, come and invest with the robot. If you look, it, it's funny, folks. You can look it up. There's stuff on YouTube you can pull up about Russian police arresting a robot, you know, and things. It, it's nothing of like what you could think of. It looks like it has a giant touch screen on its chest. It can't be more than about four foot tall wheels. It's got arms down to its side. Yeah. It looks like you would bring it up like it would ask you questions and you would fill out a questionnaire on a touch screen right. on its chest and it would move on. That's what it's doing, <clears throat> conducting surveys, right? So it yeah. interacts with people. With it's like- something you would think you would see in an airport. Honestly, yeah. like something going around or like like we've talked about uh, before, uh, information booths, that this is a robot that you could excuse me and the robot would come to you and you could use it as a moving, roving information booth that you could just go up and tap on and then it would come up. So that really seems to be like the only thing it really was. But it's very funny to me that this is how they've. They, that they've done it, that they're like, oh, they've had to arrest it. The Russian police have. So it's just funny. So if you see it, folks, it's uh, it, it's not what you would think it would be. It doesn't seem to be. Personally, it looks to me to be a publicity stunt. Man, that is nutty. 
Check this out. An amateur archaeologist finds phenomenal trove of rock engravings. Now, this comes to us from The Guardian. An amateur archaeologist, they say, has tracked down hundreds of prehistoric rock engravings in Scotland in what has been described as a phenomenal contribution to the understanding of Britain's earliest artworks. Now, walking in all weathers once or twice a week, a man named George Curry, who's 66 years old and a musician by trade, has located, get this, more than 670 Neolithic and Bronze Age carvings over the past 15 years. Whoa. He told the Observer that it was ridiculous. I got tired of recording all the stuff. I never came across quite so much. But he believes that there's even more to be found. Now, Curry's discoveries will be included in the biggest research project into Britain's prehistoric rock art, a five-year, one-million-pound study starting next year. The project will be hosted by Historic Environment Scotland, or HES, under the leadership of Dr. Tertia Barnett, who's an honorary fellow of the University of Edinburgh. Rock art, they say, is relatively undervalued and little known. And they say that this project is very exciting. More than 6,000 prehistoric carved rocks are recorded all across Britain, of which some 2,500 have been found in Scotland. And they say most of the times the patterns are based on cup marks, which is a circular depression in the surface, often surrounded by concentric rings with lines or grooves that extend from them. And they're thought to date from 4,000 to 2,000 years B.C. Now, their original purpose and significance remains a mystery. Among some of the theories that academics have, they speculate that they might be territorial markers, they may be fertility symbols, they may be astronomical signs, or they simply may be prehistoric doodles. The design and symbols appear to have been shared all across Europe, they say. So it's interesting that even long ago, it shows that people were in contact with each other from, you know, Scotland to England to France to northern Spain to Switzerland to northern Italy, Sardinia and Scandinavia, because they found these same symbols, these same rock carvings in all of those countries. So it seems to me like it's more than a doodle, right? But they yeah, don't know yeah. really what it is. But that's pretty cool that they're still finding this stuff. And what's remarkable is for one guy to find 670 different ones in a 15 year period. I mean, what does this guy know that the other, you know, archaeologists of the area don't yeah. know? How yeah, is how's he, so he pulling good? it off? Yeah. I don't know. How's he but, doing uh, that? Pretty cool. It is. It's really cool. I want to know how he's got that, that special power. That'd be a fun special power to have. You know, they always talked about, you know, list your the, the most useless, like, superpower. If you could list one of what you would think that you would, if you had to have a superpower that was useless, what would you want? I wouldn't necessarily say useless, but that's the superpower that I want. I want to be able to find, like, ancient megalithic buried things that we don't even know. That talks about human, you know, existence. That's the power that I want to no, be able to me. know exactly where they're at. I would like to have the power to take sickness away from certain people and then give it to others. I told you that. I told you <laughs> I've wanted that for years. Yeah, right? I wanted to wish that on all kinds of people. Yeah, is it like a totally cool person, like Patrick Swayze or something? They got some affliction, a cancer or something. Wouldn't it be nice to take that away from them and then give it to like some rapist or something? Yeah, I'm you down. Know? Well, that would be a pretty cool superhero, right? Uh, there I you think, go. Yeah. Done. Better, better copyright that idea soon. That's right. Before That's Stan right. Lee steals it. Folks, there is a, a town in Portage County, Ohio, a beautiful little spot named Ravina. And it was there that a 31-year-old resident named Amy Kovacs just reported this to Cryptozoology News, folks. She saw a giant bird. Ooh. Yeah, that's right. Her, her husband, and a friend saw this giant bird. She says, I live in the back of a mobile home park. I turned around and walked a few steps away from my husband and friend to light a cigarette. While pulling one out, I looked up to see what looked to be a giant bird take off from behind my home. I think it was perched there in a tree. Now, what she described was a black animal having a wingspan of 13 feet. She said it only needed <laughs> to flap its wings twice to raise itself above tree level, and the wings seemed to bend or fold like as if they were too long, mimicking elbows, and it seemed to glide downward before it attempted to go up. Now, she believes the bird was big enough to pick up a 10-year-old kid. Now, she said that its feet were very much like those of a vulture, but that the animal was too big to be an Ohio species. She's gone on to say that a neighbor seven years before this told me she saw what looked to be two black California condors perched on a telephone pole together. And then he goes into talking about a few more sightings, and we've covered most all of these sightings. But right. 
This is what I like about this sighting, folks. It's not a pterosaur. It's not a roping. It's not a dinosaur sighting like we've, we've covered and we've discussed. This is a giant bird sighting, which is always fascinating because Ohio is known for such high strangeness and for these large animals. We talk about dogmen in Ohio. They talk about the thunderbirds up in that area. I mean, Ohio, to be such a small and beautiful area... It's got a lot of extremely high strangeness in it, and this seems to be another one. She sees this big bird, but you know what? Yet again, you go back into, it's hard to estimate their size whenever you see them against a, a big, you know, a blue background or, you know, whatever the background is. It's hard to say, but you would know, even just living out there, I mean, you would know, anybody would know that that bird wasn't of normal size right? if you saw it lift up, you know? So I'm not saying it's a 13-foot wingspan or whatnot, but... If it was, if it is one of these condors that she's, you know, her, her one of her neighbors claimed to have seen a California condor or something along those lines, then I think, yes. I mean, I don't think it's misidentification. Undoubtedly, it's a large bird. Maybe the size isn't quite right, but it's a very large bird that she saw. Who knows? Maybe it was real. I would. I love. I want these things to be real. I want there to be a trove of 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 roping. Of pterosaurs found in some cave that somewhere. That would be cool, right? I want there to be a trove of, you know, maybe 30 or 40 birds with wingspans of 30 feet just found somewhere. You know, these are things that I wish that we would just find pockets that you just kind of like, or at least one, or like a, a feather. Like, I like to find a oh, feather yeah, like that's a like four feather? feet. Like the size of your arm? Yeah. The something. quill is like, you know, two inch in diameter? Yeah, exactly. looks like a pool cue. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I want to find. Well, creeping, uh, creeping, we're sticking with the cryptozoology theme. This comes from Phantoms and Monsters, where Lon was talking about he recently received an email from these folks down in Florida where a guy claimed that him and his wife wanted to detail some of the Bigfoot activity that's happening around their home. Now, check this out. He says, Dear Lon, after reading the Mingo County, West Virginia resident and some other stories, we thought that you may want to read what we are putting up with here at our own home. Now, we live in Marion County, Florida, and are retired couple. We are in a neighborhood very near Ocala National Forest. When we moved here in 2014... We were told of strange sightings in the area, in particular, Bigfoot. Now, we had moved from New York City, so I figured it was just a bunch of hogwash, just like the alligators in the New York City sewers. To make a long story short, here's the list of things that are going on here at our property. Number one, howling late at night. Intense, guttural screams, to be exact. Many times, they come from different directions at one time. I know that Bigfoot are making the noises because we have encountered them on more than one occasion. One broke my side garage door not too long after we moved in. Now, we weren't home at the time, but I have no doubt that that's what did the damage. My wife saw a young one in her garden one evening. She turned the porch light on and it scampered into the brush. She described it as four feet tall or so with long, dark hair all over its body. They like to leave things around the yard and patio. Usually, it's other people's garbage cans and bottles for the most part. Now, I don't want to encourage the activity by leaving something for them, but I'm sure to you that I mean them no harm. I've never seen another animal in our yard, which I believe is unusual because of where we live. We feel that Bigfoot roam so near to our property that small animals avoid this whole area. Now, this could be a wrong assumption, but the lack of raccoons, possums, etc. is awfully strange. I'm not going to try to take photographs because I believe that they know better and that it would anger them. A fellow on our block tried to set out a motion-sensitive camera. Well, the damage they endured from a Bigfoot, a busted camera, a broken lawn furniture, and uprooted plants changed those plans. I've seen people going into the forest at other locations, and it's obvious that they are searching for Bigfoot, even though the wildlife is protected. My feeling is that they should leave these creatures alone. Though I doubt they'll ever find one, they are very keen and aloof, most magical in the way that they go about their lives. I didn't want to give out our exact location. We don't want the Bigfoot people trampling about in our neighborhood. Thanks very much. That's it. Now, look, I hate to be the naysayer. You know, I hate to call this gentleman out. But it is awfully odd that you're talking about these occurrences. You don't want to take any pictures. You don't want to make any recordings. You don't want to even give him. This is a private email, but don't remind you. Yeah. You don't want to give even a location. I mean, it's fine if you say, hey, Lon, here's the location. Please don't publish where this is. But, you know, you know, and then 
He didn't see the Sasquatch damage his garage. He just knows that that's what it was yeah. that did it. And then he finds trash in the yard. He knows that's, I mean, look, like I said, I can never tell somebody they have not seen what they've seen. Mm-hmm. It just seems to me that you're you're making a stretch. I mean, how do you know that that wasn't dogs, you know, just carrying trash through your yard? Or, you know, how do you know something else? Maybe a burglar tried to break into your garage exactly. door and, and yeah. was unsuccessful. I don't know. But, I mean, am I wrong for thinking that way? Well, it's always one of those things, and you and I had a friend that used to talk about all the cool toys and stuff that they had whenever we were younger, but then they kept saying, oh, well, I can never show them to you. Uh, my parents make me keep them in our big walk-in uh, uh, safe. You know, oh, you yeah. remember all that stuff, yeah. and we were like, really? You you get oh, yeah, all this that. cool stuff, but you we can't play with it when we come over? And then we're like, well, don't, and, and don't ask my parents where the safe is, because they don't like me to tell everybody we have a safe. And then, of course, you later find out that, that friend didn't have a safe. They didn't have any. They're just telling you crazy stories. It almost feels that way. Like, oh, well, I got all this, but I can't show it to you, man. I can't even tell you about I can't, where it's yeah. at. I mean, yeah. it's just a little Then why odd. come forward with it? <laughs> You're just Then don't come forward with any of that, because it doesn't do a bit of good. Right, I agree. At all. Folks, we're going to wrap up with the crazy nonsense of, of of crypto attacking garages right now, and we're going to get into something on the other side of this base that we've been approached, and uh, we weren't going to do it, and then we were, and then we kind of put it off, and then to be honest with you, it fell into the cracks, and we totally forgot about it, and it popped up due to a, a, an email that we received, and somebody had asked us to talk about it, so that's what we're going to get into, folks, and uh, we're going to jump into, on the other side of this break, the mystery of the Dulce base. So stick around. I think you're going to enjoy what's coming up next. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. We are back, and we are going to jump into, like I alluded to, the Dulce Base mystery. Now, we need to lay down the groundwork a little bit. Most of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with the things that have happened there, or alleged to have happened in this area. But we're going to get into a little bit of the, you know, the history. We're going to build up to it, and there's a lot that goes into this. And we're just going to scratch the surface of some interesting things and the stuff that we've looked at. But I think it's going to make for a little interesting thought pattern, if nothing else. Agua Dulce. That was the original name in Spanish of this area, and it stands for sweet water. Apparently, there is some very uh, sweet water that comes from the presence of natural springs in this area. And, of course, the people and animals were drawn to this. Now, Dulce was originally founded by a ranching family that goes by the name of Gomez. And their original homestead in that area was founded in 1877 by a Jose Gomez. Now, well, interestingly enough, the Hickoria Apache Reservation there in New Mexico, which we've spoken about before, was also established in 1877 when, of course, the Apache people were forced onto the res. They were also forced. The res was kind of built, let's say, around this ranching operation. So the land that the family, the Gomez family has that started, the, you know, the, the Dulce in New Mexico had the, the reservation built up around it. The population as of 2000, this was a while back, was only 2,623 people. And Dulce, and it's made almost entirely of Native Americans. And in, in fact, it's the largest community and tribal headquarters of the Hickory Apache Reservation. Now, the best way, I guess, or that is the best way to kind of start this entire story, not only because we're about to go really deep into this rabbit hole, folks, that could be entirely true, all of it, or 100% of it could be disinformation and a complete and total lie. We have no way of knowing this, people. But as all of you that listen to the show already know that the truth, Kyle and I believe, lies somewhere 
in the middle. So, with that said, let us flip on our headlamps and stroll off into the darkness of the Dulce underground base. Now, this case has so many of the famous players in the world of which we all find so intriguing. People like Mr. Gabe Valdez. For those of you that don't remember Gabe, he's the New Mexico State Trooper that in 1979 started investigating and basically paved the way for cattle mutilation research and study. And also, Mr. Paul Benowitz, the doctor, who was an electronic specialist. And of course, in late 79, he began to film and photograph and electronically intercept what he believed to be extensive UFO and ET activity and the communications in the mountain range areas there in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then, of course, he believed he had traced it all the way back to the Archuleta Mesa on the Hickoria Reservation near the town of Dulce. Now, later on, he had lost his mind, and the last years of his life were plagued with madness and sadness, if you will, and a simple search of his name, or watching the Netflix documentary that Kyle and I have discussed called Mirage Men will show you what he went through. And like any great conspiracy, was this all just disinformation, or was this something more substantial to his claims? Heck, Bob Lazar's name has even been tossed around when it comes to this place. And Phil Snyder is another man who many believe lost his life due to him blowing the whistle on what he was part of, the underground base at Dulce. But before I get ahead of myself, I'd like to speak about another whistleblower that allegedly stole some controversial papers known simply as the Dulce Papers. The man I'm speaking of is Thomas Edwin Castillo. See, in 1987, Mr. Castillo organized the release of 30 photos, video, and a set of papers to UFO researchers that were apparently physical evidence of a joint UFO or extraterrestrial base along with the U.S. government located two miles beneath the Archuleta Mesa near the town of, that's right, folks, Dulce, New Mexico. The collection became known in the circles of, of researchers as the Dulce Papers, and it was there that they had found that it provided graphic evidence of the operations of this secret underground facility, and it also appeared to provide a lot of support to Dr. Benowitz's conclusions regarding the activities at this base. The Dulce papers described genetic experimentation, development of human extraterrestrial hybrids, mind control, and its uses through advanced computers, cold storage of human beings in vats filled with some strange liquid, and even the use of human body parts as a nutritional source for the extraterrestrial races. That's right, folks, as food for these visitors. The papers provided also what many see as a possible evidence that humans were used as little more than lab animals by these races, working directly with different U.S. government agencies and some large U.S. corporations that were fulfilling black budget military contracts. And if these papers were the real deal, well, then, of course, that it means that the experiments and all of these things that involved human rights violations are all real and some of the darkest chapters in recent human history, folks. But we're going to get back to Thomas. See, we're going to talk about Thomas's background. Thomas, in 1961, was a young sergeant, and he was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base, they're close to, uh, to Las Vegas. And in, in the military, his job was a photographer. Interestingly enough, his photography job got him a top secret clearance. Now, later on, he was transferred to West Virginia, where he had trained in advanced intelligent photography. And he worked inside an undisclosed underground installation. And due to the nature of this assignment, he even had his clearance then upgraded now, he remained with the Air Force as a photographer, of course, until 1971, when he was offered a job as a security technician with Rand Corporation. So he moved to California, where Rand had a major facility, and then again, his security clearance was upgraded. Now, in 1977, Thomas was transferred to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oddly enough, he says that his pay was raised significantly, and his security clearance again was 
upgraded. This time, though, it was upgraded to Ultra 7. And his job was to photo security specialists in the... Dis his job was as a photo security specialist in the Dulce installation, where his job specification was to maintain, align, and calibrate video monitoring cameras throughout the entire underground complex and to escort visitors to their destinations. Now, in the time since he claims that he left his employers there at Dulce in 1979 and the release of these papers in 1986, Castillo gave a number of interviews and corresponded with several UFO researchers before he vanished. That's right, folks. Kaiser Soze style, up and vanished into thin air. Now, there's some transcripts and correspondence from interviews that he gave. And we're going to get into some of those. But we're going to talk about this, too. It is the extensive video monitoring that occurred at Dulce that apparently provided Castillo all the information that he needed and that he learned from the base before we get into this. And the human rights abuses that eventually led him to leave. That's what he claimed. So he could see all. So you have to imagine you're working on all the cameras. You're calibrating everything. You're taking visitors to and from. And then also you know what's going on there. It's weighing heavy on your heart. Now, his claims, of course, are outlined in two different sources, folks. The papers themselves that involved what he said was classified material taken from the base and then these interviews that he had give. And like I said, it wasn't much. But now officially confirming Thomas's employment there, his military and even his educational background and his status as a whistleblower. Well, folks, that's not been possible. But what has been possible is that a number of these researchers that was in contact with him before his disappearance in the late 80s got a series of questions and answers done with him that are very, very interesting. And that's where we're going to pick up, folks. We're going to pick up with these questions and answers from Mr. Castillo. Hey, Mr. Costello, you got a few minutes to answer some questions? Sure, sure, go right ahead. When was the upper human occupied level of the Archuleta installation constructed? Well, I heard Dulce was started in 1937 or 1938 by the Army engineers, enlarged over the years. Most recent work was completed in 1965 to 66 to connect tunnels to the Page, Arizona base side of one of the older underground facilities. The Four Corners base is called Perica. Most of the Native Americans living in that area are aware that the base is there and can tell us about the underground life forms that frequently are spotted near those communities, Bigfoot and similar. I see, I see. Um, by what means was the upper installation constructed? In other words, are you familiar with the alleged developments made by the Rand Corporation of a highly efficient bore or mole machine capable of melting rock using nuclear-powered Wolfram graphite-tipped drill cones. Are you aware of any of that? Yeah, well, well, according to several senior maintenance workers there, part of it was blasted by nuclear devices in the 1960s. There are sections, like the shuttle tunnels, that were formed by an advanced tunneling machine that leaves the tunnel walls smooth. The finished walls in those tubes resembled polished black glass. By whom was the Dulce installation originally constructed? Well, nature started the caverns. The Draco, or the reptilian humanoids, used the caverns and tunnels for centuries. Now later, through Rand Corporation plans, it was enlarged repeatedly. The original caverns included ice caves and sulfur springs that the aliens found perfect for their needs. The Dulce Caverns rival Carlsbad Caverns in size. Really? Hmm, interesting. Are the various electromagnetically controlled air or space craft that have been seen leaving to and from and arriving from Mount Archulette manned by humans? Or are they alien entities, or, or is it both? Well, Archuleta Mesa is a minor area. The craft leave and are stored in five areas. One is southeast of Dulce, one near Durango, Colorado, and one at Taos, New Mexico, and the main fleet is stored at, or, or more likely under, of course, Los Alamos. Now, others have told me 
that some of the entities below Dulce are not of extraterrestrial origin, and in fact, they are actually descended from saurian or reptiloid beings, such as velociraptors or other types of dinosaurs, a serpentine race or races, similar to that hinted at in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Are you familiar with any of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, some reptoids are native to this planet. The ruling caste of aliens are reptilian. The beige, or white beings, are called the Draco. Other reptilian beings are green, and some are brown. They were an ancient race on Earth living underground. It may have been one of the draconian beings that tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. Reptoids rightly consider themselves native Tarians. Perhaps they are the ones we call the fallen angels. Maybe not, but either way, we are considered squatters here on Earth. Hmm. You know, I've spoken to a couple of researchers that were, may, were go unnamed, and they've suggested to me that the so-called underground extraterrestrial bases in the tunnels may, for a large part, be literally thousands of years old, and constructions of the antediluvian race, which attained to the considerable level of scientific complexity, and who were destroyed by a divinely initiated cataclysm which took place after the attempted merge of their science with the occult and supernatural forces. For instance... Some have suggested to me that the Bermuda Triangle phenomenon may be the result of an out-of-control Atlantean experiment that led to a space-time disaster which produced electromagnetic fallout in the Triangle area and elsewhere after they accidentally used powerful forces and engines into the world that they now that they knew very little about. I'm sorry. Do your observations tend to confirm or refute such a possibility? Well, I'm not sure about the divine part. But these aliens consider themselves native Tarians. Well, where do the little gray aliens fit into all this? Well, they work for and are controlled by the Draco. There are other gray-skinned beings that are not in league with the Draco. Did you ever, by chance, talk to any of these aliens at the base? Well, since I was the senior security technician at the base, I had to communicate with them on a daily basis. If there were any problems that involved security or video cameras... I was the one they called. It was the reptilian working caste that usually did the physical labor in the lower levels of Dulce. Decisions involving that caste were usually made by the white Draco. When human workers caused problems for the working caste, the reptoids went to the white draconian boss, and the Draco called me. Now, at times, it felt like it was a never-ending problem. Several human workers resented the no-nonsense or get-back-to-work attitude the working class there lives by, but when needed intervention became a vital tool. The biggest problem were human workers who foolishly wandered around near the off-limit areas of the alien section. You know, I guess it's human nature to be curious and to wonder what is past the barriers. Too often someone found a way to bypass the barriers and nosed around. The cameras near the entrance usually stopped them before they got themselves into any serious trouble. But a few times I had to formally request the return of a human worker. I see, I see. Are there any other sites tied to this shuttle network you speak about, other than those which you mentioned? And if so, where are the entrances? Oh yeah, man, they're everywhere. They crisscross the world as an endless subterranean highway. Like a freeway, except this one's underground. And the highway depends on electric motors for trucks and cars and buses, for the paved roads and for its limited travel. There's another style of transit for freight and for passengers that is kind of like rapid travel. That worldwide network is called the Subglobal System and has checkpoints in each country enter entry there. Now there are shuttle tubes that shoot the trains at incredible speeds using like maglev and vacuum methods. They travel at a speed that excels the speed of sound. So part of your question involves the location of entrances to that base. But the easiest way to answer it is to say that every state in the U.S. has them. Frequently, the entrances are camouflaged as sand quarries or mining operations or other complex portals, of course, are found there on military bases. Now, New Mexico and Arizona have the largest amounts of these entrances, and then, of course, they're followed in suit by California, Idaho, Montana, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Kansas, Arkansas, and Missouri. All of the states, Florida and North Dakota, have the least amount of entrances. Wyoming has a road that opens directly into a subterranean freeway. That road is no longer in use, but it could be reactivated, I guess, if they decided to do so. And with very minimal cost. It's actually located near Brooks Lake. Are there any bases in the state of Utah? Have you heard anything about an alleged underground installation within the Wasatch Mountains? 
Salt Lake, uh, Lake Powell area, Dugway Grounds, of course, Dark Canyon, Modena, and Vernal. Uh, all have exits there. Others, too. Does the Mount uh, Archuleta shuttle system connect with the shuttle system I've heard about, which allegedly radiates from Mount Shasta in Northern California? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mount Shasta is a major site of alien elder race, a reptilian race, and human meetings. Uh, beginning with Glover, Cleveland, every U.S. president has history that is tied to that area, to Tello City. Uh, Truman was supposed to have visited the lower realms as a high archon on Earth, and he was supposed to have met the king of the world there and gave him the keys to the USA. Oh, man, I see. Um, I'm not taking up too much of your time, am I? No, 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 no it's fine. Okay, well, I'm going to go out. Since you seem to be coming forth with all this information, you don't think I'm totally crazy. I'm going to ask you this. Is there any truth to the allegations that the CIA or aliens have actually established bases on the moon and also on Mars? I've heard that too, but I haven't seen proof with my own eyes. The aliens do allegedly have bases on several moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And the CIA operates in other countries, but I've never heard they operate on other planets. Okay. Um, have you heard any hints or rumors suggesting that there may be even more lower levels beneath the Ultra 7 level at the Dulce base, and also where these might lead to and what they might consist of? Well, first off, yeah, yeah, I have. And your guess is as good as mine. I mean, sure, there was lots of talk about it, but it doesn't mean that it's there. I mean, however, I can tell you this, that I saw elevators that were off limits unless you had an Umbra or higher security clearance. So at that base, information is supplied to me at a need-to-know basis only. My clearance, of course, is only Ultra 7. I understand. Um, Some people have insisted to me that the U.S. or a secret government or a breakaway society has actually developed its own disc craft based largely upon top-secret anti-gravitic experiments carried out by the Nazi German scientists during World War II. Have you heard anything along the lines of this, referring to this? Well, when I was working in photo security, I heard a lot of talk, but I never really saw proof myself. But once, in the Air Force, I developed a roll of film for some people, and it showed a craft like Adamski's craft, and there was a swastika on the side. Now, Tom, did you ever have access to the alien craft, and were you ever inside any of them? I'm dying to know. Yeah, actually, yeah. I frequently saw them in garages. There are quite a few of them. The main fleet is stored at Los Alamos, and yes, I've entered several crafts. There were two things that stick in my mind. One is the odd, spongy feeling of the floors, and the unusual pinkish-purple color of the lighting. The crew stated the floor becomes rigid in flight and that the purple tint of the lighting changes to bright blue-white. The entire inside of the aircraft and is rather scaled down in size when compared to the average human. Another thing that's cool is the halls were curved and narrow, but somehow, when inside, it appears bigger than it looks. Like certain areas, the outermost sections almost felt and looked, for lack of a better word, alive. I was never taken up into that one, though. Can you give me more information on the reptilian race you spoke of? What do they do on this sixth level that they, they call the Nightmare Hall? Sure, sure. Okay. The worker cast does the daily chores. The mopping the latex floors, cleaning the cages, bringing food to the hungry people and other species. It's their job to formulate the proper mixture for the type one and type two beings that the Draco race has created. The working cast work at the labs as well as at the computer banks. So basically speaking, the reptilian races are active at all levels of the Dulce base. There are several different races of aliens that work on the east section of the level six. No doubt I'm sure some are collaborating Nordic factions also, you know, in these areas, but the section is commonly called the alien section. So the Draco are the undisputed masters of the levels five, six, and seven. The humans are second in command on those levels. I had to argue with one large draconian boss frequently. His name's too difficult to verbalize. Real throaty, lots of K's. I usually just called him Karsh, and he hated it. The draconian leaders are very formal when talking to the human race. These ancient guys, these ancient beings, that consider us a lower race. Karsh called me Leader Costello. But it was used in a very sarcastic way. Now, however... The worker cast is friendly enough, as long as you allow them to speak first. They will answer if you address them. They are very cautious beings and consider most humans to be hostile. 
they always seemed surprised when they found many of the humans were open and trustworthy. Now, there's no fraternizing with aliens off hours. It is forbidden to speak to any alien race in the halls or an elevator without clear business-oriented reasons. Now, the humans can talk to other humans, of course, and aliens can talk to other aliens, but as far as it goes, that's it. At the work site, however, it's totally different. There's free speech in the labs. The camaraderie found in these labs also reaches the computer bank section. In those areas, everybody talks to anybody. However, everything changes the minute you cross the threshold of the hall. Instantly, of course, all these conversations become strictly formal. And hard as it was, several times I had to arrest someone simply because they spoke to an alien. Man, I'm telling you, it's a strange, strange place. Hmm. Well, what exactly first made you aware that something was wrong, you know, there at Dulce? And, you know, it seems to me that a place obviously as horrible as this that you wouldn't have to be Einstein to realize that there's crimes going on, crimes to humanity taking place at this site. And my second question would be, what took you so long to speak up about it? And third, are you the guy that blew the whistle? It's a good question, and, and I understand where you're coming from, and there's several things that you should know about. I took an oath under the penalty of death that no matter what I saw or heard, I would never divulge the information. Also, I signed a waiver that states I would willingly give up my life if I was found guilty of treason. At the Dulce base, treason is anything that mentions the details of daily operations at this facility. When outside the confinement of this base, so that's got gotcha. you. When I first arrived, I needed to know policy was in effect. The story the honchos told us was that. This is a tri-biotransfer facility with advanced technology, doing advanced adventurous methodology for medical and mental gains. Which is a fancy way of saying that they do really risky things with human life just to see what would happen. If a medical cure happens, it would be heralded on the surface of the earth as a marvelous new cure, saying it was found after years of research at some well-known medical lab. The real story of the cure is never explained, though. And then, after all, the Dulce base is a secret facility. These people are very good at what they do. They do not tell the truth about the unfortunate people that end up in Nightmare Hall. I worked with aliens, and with that in mind, you should get the idea of the kind of secrecy and the security of this place. Now look, I know this was not the usual hospital-type job site, but in the beginning, I bought the whole package, man. I, I was reminded daily by Intercom in the elevators that this site does high-risk advanced medical and drug testing to cure insanity. Now please, never speak to the inmates. It can destroy years of work. Okay, I'm sensible. When doctors say don't speak to them, who was I to destroy this delicate situation? But one man somehow caught my eye. He repeatedly stated that he was George S. And that he had been kidnapped and he was sure someone was searching for him. I don't know why he sticks in my mind. I found I was remembering his face, thinking he sure didn't look or sound insane. But many inmates said that. Well, the next weekend, I convinced a friend of mine, a cop, to run a check on a guy, saying I had a run-in with him and was curious. I didn't mention the base at all. It was a sickening feeling when the computer confirmed that Mr. George S. was missing. What's worse, the cops thought he was just another guy that got tired of the daily grind and split. That was the beginning. Am I the one that blew the whistle? No. The next Monday, I searched for George, but he was gone. There were no records that explained what had happened to him. It was another security officer that came to me saying that he and some lab workers wanted an off-duty meeting at one of the tunnels off the record. Curiosity took over, and I said, okay. And that night, hell, about nine men showed up. They said that they knew they were risking me turning them in, but they wanted to show me some things they thought that I should see. And one by one, they showed records that proved many inmates were very in that, just missing people. There were newspaper clippings and even photos that they had somehow smuggled into the base. They had hoped to smuggle them back out without me turning them into the honchos, and I could see the fear on their faces as they asked me these things. One man stated that he'd rather lose his life by trying than lose his soul by not doing anything at all. It was that remark that turned the tide. I told them about George and the things that I'd found out about him. After a few hours, we pledged to attempt to expose the Dulce base. Man, that's... It's incredible. Um, the name, Nightmare Hall, it's a nickname, right? I'm um, Surely it's not, that's not what they call it. That's not its regular name in any of the manuals, right? 
Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. In the manuals, it was called the vivarium. It describes Dulce Base as a secured facility for tending bioforms of all types. In their report, it is retold as a private subterranean biothermal park with accommodations for animals, fish, fowl, reptile, and even mankind. And of course, after seeing this park, the name Nightmare Hall is a far more accurate than what's in the manual. The accommodations for these inmates at Nightmare Hall fall short of the pretty picture that the manual describes. Hmm. Now, you you mentioned uh, one reptilian leader. Uh, you said it was really hard to pronounce his name, had a lot of consonants in it. Do you know anything about him in particular? Like, like where is he from? Is he actually from Earth? Or is he from some other planet? <laughs> yeah, it is definitely hard to pronounce. Yeah, his name means Keeper of the Laws. They receive their name after they reach the age of awareness. They do not recognize time as an important factor in being aware the way humans do. And upon their age of awareness, they are cognitive to the station or position they are destined to fulfill. At that time, they choose or allow someone to choose their name. Their name will include the position they hold and several personally chosen letters. Uh, each letter has a personal meaning, known only to the, the alien, of course, and to the one that chose their name. Karsh is who you're speaking of, and since Karsh's name means keeper of the law, his name includes Cash, memory or keep, based on the Akashic record, and Fost, law, or based on the word fast or bind. Reptilians chose to be not only private, but secretive of the location of their, their natal place. To them, birth or emergence of life is considered one of the sacred rites of life. They consider Earth or Terra their home planet but several reptoids discuss several star maps. Most of those stars were within the Milky Way. Within those star maps lie the stars and planets of the planets of the Allegiance Earth being one of those planets in their trade routes. So if any human asked clear questions about the Allegiance, the aliens referred the questions to Draco. Uh, the Draco, in return, referred the questions to their supervisor, me. I didn't have that information about the stars because information was supplied on a need-to-know basis. And I didn't need that information. <laughs> Did any of the, the working cast join in the revolt? And if so, could you actually give me some of their names? Matter of fact, yeah, there was a few of the reptilian janitorial crew let us know that they knew we were attempting to sabotage the work on the 6th and 7th levels. One of them, with the name Shawl, secretly formed his own little small group of reptoids with the same mindset as my group. And Shawl took it upon himself, the danger of informing me. He was you know, open as possible in this unique situation. And on the day I found out about it, I was inspecting a camera near the exit tunnel. And he approached and then stooped over to talk to me. And he's seemingly scraping some non-existent dirt. I don't know what he said. And he quietly said, a few of us agreed that you were singular in your interest in missing human reports. If true, walk away. I'll reach you. If it's untrue, destroy my life now. My heart almost leapt out of my chest but I silently walked towards one of the wide halls. And for the rest of my life, I'll remember those words. It was the first time I knew reptilians could have individual thoughts or opinions. So basically, they formed a uniform front with a small variety of interests, or at least that's what we had thought. And it was a couple of days before I heard from him again. And as he walked beside me in the sixth level's infamous hall, I heard him say, enter the exit tunnel on the sixth level north after your shift. The next few hours were long, of course, and, and filled with thoughts of betrayal and even worse, but I shouldn't have worried. I contacted one of the original nine resistance men and let him know just in case. Well, Gordon, he wanted to go with me, but I convinced him to wait a few feet from the exit and pretended like he was having trouble with his little electric cart there, kind of like a golf cart. And when I got there, there were three of them. Shawl formally introduced me to Fasha and Humasha. Name base word is shash, or to assist. With that, I quickly grabbed Gordon from the hall, and the five other of us just stood around and talked. We walked into the dark tunnels for about three hours, and after that day, well, they joined the resistance group, and it got bigger and bolder. Ultimately, it ended with a military assault, was initiated, of course, through the exit tunnels, and they executed anybody on their list, human or reptilian. We fought back, but none of the working cast had weapons, nor did the human lab workers. Only the security force and a few computer workers had flash guns. It was a massacre, man. I mean, everyone was screaming and running for cover. The halls, the tunnels, everything was filled. It was just, it was madness. We believe it was the Delta Force because the uniforms and the method they used, they chose to hit and shift change, or right at shift change. And, and that effort, you know, that just killed as many of the names on the list as possible. 
and to this day we don't know who betrayed us. Gordon Henry ran beside me as we ran into the third levels of the exit tunnels, and he died with several bullets shot in the back. I vaporized the assassin guy that shot at him and just kept running, and to this day I'm still running, and Gordon is always on my mind. Man, that's incredible. Tell me more about this flash gun. Is it difficult to operate, or is it like the weapon on Star Trek that you can set to stun or kill? Or any other different modes. <laughs> well, it is an advanced beam weapon that can operate on three different phases. Phase one, like Star Trek, can stun or maybe kill if the person has a weak heart. Now, phase two, it can levitate anything, no matter what it weighs. And phase three is the serious business mode. It can be used to paralyze anything that lives. Animals, humans, aliens, even plants. On the higher position on that same mode, it can create a temporary death. Now, I assure you, any doctor would certify the person dead, but their life essence lingers in some strange limbo, some kind of terrible state of non-death. In one to five hours, the person will revive slowly. First, the bodily functions will begin, and then in a few minutes, consciousness, and then they'll wake up and kind of be fully aware. In that mode, the alien scientists reprogram the human brain and plant false information. So when the person awakes, he recalls the false information as information he gained through the life experience there. So there's no way for a person to really learn the truth. The human mind remembers and believes completely false data. If you attempt to inform them, they would laugh or get angry. They never believe the truth. Their mind always forgets the experience of reprogramming. If you ask if the flash gun is difficult to operate, man, a two-year-old child could use it with one hand. It resembles a flashlight with black glass and a conical inverted lens. On the side are three recessed knobs in three curved grooves. Each knob now is different sized. The closer the knob to the hand, the less the strength. It's that simple. Each knob has three strengths also, with automatic stops in each position. The strongest position will vaporize anything that lives. That mode is so powerful, it will leave no trace on what's vaporized. Is this weapon called a flash gun? Or once again, is there actually a different name for it in the manuals? <laughs> Everybody calls them flash guns, or more commonly, the flash, or my flash, when talking about it. In the manual, it's first introduced as the Armalux weapon, but after that, it's simply explained as the flash gun. What type of security is found at Dulce Base? I mean, what else is used against espionage or any unauthorized entry? I'll mention a few here, but it would be nearly impossible to cover all of them. I mean, the weapon, besides the flash gun, mostly used is a, a form of sonic uh, built in with each light fixture and most camcorders is a device that could render a man unconscious in seconds with nothing more than a silent tone. So at Dulce, there's also these still and VCR cameras, eye prints, hand print stations, weight monitors, lasers, ELF and EM equipment, heart sensors, man, we got motion detectors, quite a few other methods. There's no way you could get very far into the base. If you made it to the second level, man, you'd be spotted within the first 15 feet. More than likely, you would become an inmate and never see the light of the surface world again. If you were lucky, you'd be reprogrammed and become one of the countless spies for the ruling caste. Now, according to certain reports, the Dulce base is host to other aliens that live in level 5. Do you know if that's true? And if so, can the humans freely roam or meet one-to-one -one in the halls, or is there some type of protocol in effect that prohibits that? Well, there, there is protocol for the first time you enter the base, and it must be followed every time you see an alien there. Like we discussed, I mean, man, for the first, from the working cast to the visiting aliens to the ruling cast, there's never-ending checklists of rules, laws, strict protocol, so there's never a chance to roam on the fifth level. The alien housing area is off-limits to any human, so the hub is surrounded by security and an arsenal and military and even CIA and FBI uh, sections there. The area past security is one of the most secured areas because it houses so many classified files. The entire east side of the fifth area, or that fifth level, I'm sorry, is off limits except for security personnel holding, like what I had, the Ultra 7 security clearance or higher. The garage on the west side of the fifth level even requires Ultra 4 clearance. Hmm. Um, and I have to tell you, I find all of this pretty fascinating. I understand, yeah, yeah. Um, no, please don't take this the wrong way. Is there any proof available that could come from all these allegations of this underground base, this supposed underground base? I mean, I guess, are we just supposed to take your word for it and believe you? <laughs> I understand that question, too, completely, completely. Well, many people have asked me that one, and no, man, I don't expect people to believe me with blind faith. There is tangible proof that has been seen and felt 
and inspected by quite a few people. I see, I'm in no position to go on a lecture circuit to explain to every person on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm trying to stay alive. All I can do is state again that Dulce is a secret facility. They work hard to make sure nobody can find this place. If everyone could easily find it, it wouldn't be a secret facility. I've explained the extreme security methods they use. There's another proof available. There are five sets of copies in five different boxes in five different locations that hold complete proof of everything I've tried to explain. Well, I got another question. Where is your family? I mean, not just your mm -hmm. wife and son, but parents and siblings. Mm -hmm. Well, Kathy and Eric are still missing. Uh, my parents died in a car crash when I was in my teens. I have one brother. If he's alive, I'm, I suspect he's inside an underground base somewhere. I haven't heard for him for several years. Please pray for them. Please. Um, what is your birth date? And where were you born? The 23rd of April, 1941. Glen Ellen, Illinois. Actually on a farm at home. In the place now called Glen Ellen. My birth certificate listed as Wheaton, Illinois. Okay, man. It's an incredible story. Uh, you've been through so much, and yet you keep fighting. I guess my last question is, what is your biggest fear? My biggest fear? It's a good one. Uh, it's that the general public will forget the trapped innocent people in this despicable place and will ignore the hundreds of children, women, and men added to that place every month. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. An interesting interview, you know, that, that happened between this guy and Thomas Costello. Mm -hmm. You know, and if any of this is real, how, I mean, I don't even know what to think about it, right? A secret base. And this goes along with these stories of our government has been working behind the scenes with extraterrestrials, these reptilians, the greys, all this stuff. And they're at this secret base and it's underground and they're doing experiments with not just human beings but alien human hybrids they're working on secret technology anti-gravitic craft i mean it sounds you know like an episode of some sci-fi movie <laughs> but could there actually be some truth to this you know we know of these other things we know that our government has lied to us on numerous things uh whether it's the gulf of tonkin jessica lynch pat mm -hmm. tillman you know the list goes on and on and on as well as you know we've spoken to uh, people about the Montauk Chronicles. Mm, Christopher Things Garantano, like yeah, we had him on, yeah. Right, and we know that the government was messing with people. They were giving them drugs and then dressing up as extraterrestrials to try to confuse them. Mm -hmm. So again, you begs the question, were they doing that? Even though there was extraterrestrials involved, they were just doing it to mess with people's minds. Could these employees that are working at the secret base, they're doing things like that to trick them? Or is all of this <sighs> real? I mean, they're talking about this vast network of underground tunnels that connects every state in our union. Mm -hmm. And you've heard of these stories. Um, I don't know, man. It is a bizarre story. We haven't even gotten 
to to the other the guy Phil Schneider. No, we, we have to that. Yet. And we still there's more of this interview. I mean, it just keeps going and going. It's one of those things. I hope you enjoyed it, folks. It's one of those things we wanted to bring forward and we want to talk about this because a lot of it's not discussed. Is it's like a one on one thing, like a guy sitting down and telling you his experiences and what he saw. The thing that hits me the most with this fella is he vanished. Like it was literally like a year out, and then he was gone. Poof. Now we're going to get a lot of emails. I know you folks. You know, there's a lot of us going to write us. You're going to, you know, you're going to make comments on the whole thing and tell us all it's a joke, and you're going to tell us what we got wrong, and you're going to email us all these things. It happens every time we do something like this that's somewhat, you know, controversial. That's what we get. I got a few things I want to throw out there. Is it a possibility that this Thomas Castillo? Uh, is this name and identity of, of a fellow that's using this basically to reveal the information there. So like in this case, that he was like an insider leaking information, right? And that he was just wants to be anonymous, that that's not his real name. So that's the reason nobody can really, you know, pull him up. Or is it also a possibility that maybe Thomas was completely bogus, the whole thing, and he's just a disinformation guy. That's all he does is he just found some people that would listen and pumped this stuff out there. Why? I have no idea you would say all that. Or... Is it what some of it feels likely? Is it that it really is? He is who he says he is. Right. And that he said a bunch of this stuff and brought this stuff out and then he took off. There's parts of this stuff that he gives a few more, you know, answers to where he would go and what would happen if he could get out of here uh, safely of where he would flee to, how he would leave the U.S. and things of where he would go in the interview. We don't have time to get into all that stuff. It's very interesting. And like Kyle said, I mean, you, you start listening to this. And for those that are familiar with Phil Snyder, you understand his story, too, how a lot of this seems to tie in with a lot of what Thomas is talking about. I mean, all of this stuff seems to go hand in hand. Now, look, it did take place a while back. And what's funny is this guy started releasing stuff before Phil started releasing stuff. I mean, it's the way it's all kind of come about. You're like, man, is this all part of one big story right well you like you even mentioned in the story paul benowitz mm -hmm. and you mentioned the documentary mirage man mm -hmm. on netflix now if you haven't seen that i suggest you go watch that but even when i watch that it makes me think was paul benowitz at some point in time onto something and they were like look we better start we better hire this guy to go out and directly mess with him start jacking with him so that what we're doing is we're going to discredit Paul Benowitz and make it look like he went insane. Okay? Yes. Like they said, he went, he went crazy with sadness and madness. Is any of that true? Or did the government put a spin on it to make it look like he was crazy to discredit what he was claiming he was seeing and finding? You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know, man. It is spooky. Well, these I'll, black projects. I'll tell you what I feel. And I don't want to be the crazy conspiracy guy when it comes to this kind of stuff. But in, and especially when you come to where you know that disinformation is a real thing. Part of me always feels like the root for disinformation is to is a hundred percent you're covering up. And what is more fun than to to be able to say that it is to use exactly what's happening as your disinformation campaign, right? Which is easier. You're not telling a lie. It's way easier if somebody was really questioning you, if you're not lying about it. But if it's that crazy and that unbelievable of what's going on, why not? Why couldn't it be real? I mean, what's crazier than if I was telling you, if I really had discovered a woolly mammoth and I had him in my barn and I was telling guy, oh, man, why are you buying all that food? I got a woolly mammoth. I'm buying all this because I got a woolly mammoth. You'd be like, dude. You're so full of crap. Not, man, I got a woolly mammoth. And this would go on and on and on. And you would just finally think like this guy's just being a jerk. All he's talking about is, you know, it's it's disinformation. They're not alive anymore. Well, I got one. This whole thing. But it's not the way it went down. They lied to Benowitz. And or so they say. They say all the stuff they did. And maybe they did bait him to go one way or the other. But when you bait a trap for anything, you first of all have to know the person wants that trap or wants what that bait is. You can't catch an animal unless the animal eats what it is. I don't like onions. So if you baited a trap with onions, I'm not going to eat it. But if you baited a trap with chocolate, you got me. So that being said, you got to know that they. So there was there was chocolate for Benowitz to start with somewhere. Somewhere he heard before they knew he was looking into them, he found something, and that's whenever. And then when he went to make an ruckus is when they reacted. It wasn't like a, 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 a you know it was a reaction. It was a knee jerk thing. They weren't proactive. Right. They they don't come out releasing all this information, this disinfo, until somebody starts saying something. So when you reactively re release this info, it always makes me start questioning, what are you releasing it for? Well, and like, you know, if it's some crazy person that lives in an RV on some, you know, distant place, 
that's coming up with these crazy stories. No it's hate on crazy people in an no, RV. No, 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 I'm not hating. But I'm saying <laughs> Paul Benowitz was a successful like businessman. He had a su- su- successful aviation business. Also, what was the, the police officer there? Gabriel, I don't remember his last name. The Gabe, guy in Valdez. Dulce. Gabe Valdez, yeah, right. the, the state patrolman. Right, so he's a state patrolman. Why, why would he put his career at risk by coming out with all this stuff that he's seen around the Dulce base? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So to me, you got high-level people that are making these claims. What would it benefit them to mm-hmm. make this stuff up? So I tend to think that it may not be the exact story, but like we talked about before, you, in the very beginning of the story, you talked about it's somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I think that what, that's what makes this story so exciting. Yeah, I think that that's that, that's what draws me in is somewhere in the middle of all of this madness. You can chip away to where and what better missing 411. Well, maybe there are some of that. The Montauk Chronicles. Maybe that's where these people are being taken. Homeless people, people that allegedly go missing and want to start over. You always hear these stories. Oh, they just went to start over. Yeah, but you never talk to them right. oh, because they didn't reach out to their family. Yeah. Or they're in the Dulce base underground. Right. Man, that is terrifying. Well, that's about all the time we have for the free show. We're going to be doing more on the Dulce base on the Elite Show on Thursday. So if you want to listen to that, now's the time to sign up. If you have a story of your own you'd like to share, you can email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. Or you can call the show, 817-945-3828. Cam, what do you got planned for your week? Just work and meeting with the state. I've got a couple of state meetings I've got to have and do some inspections. So uh, I'll be on the carpet for a while. So uh, I don't like that. I'm, I'm not one of those guys. I don't like, for those of you that have seen my photos, and then y'all all know me well enough anyway to know that I don't do well in office situations. So uh, I've got to go and play play nice with everybody. All right. Well, you stay out of trouble. Everybody out there, be careful. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.